computer, share screen. Yes. All right. So we, we have a quite a variety to look at today. That's a lot, a lot, a lot of names, a lot of key features to them. But they're good features because they're the keys that you'll see on the test. And they'll be kind of, the, there'll be a main one for each one that you can remember you can see the description you're usually pretty good about getting out with the end of it. I just I got an email yesterday from, from the dean, and she was reminding us, and this is for y'all that have other classes, that we had to make a commitment at the beginning of the year what we were going to do for our classes. And evidently, there's some professors on campus that were not holding to that. And it may or may not be a benefit to you. What I'm talking about is that they switched to all online after they after they got started. And that seems to be the trend in some other departments. We were reminded again yesterday that we said we would hybrid hybridize the course if it's not an online course to begin with. It's not to be moved to online. So we're trying to look out for you. Online, of course, that's not really what you want. If I can just speak from experience, it's more enjoyable to be here than you guys be sitting in here than me. Only be up there on the screen and talking through the computer every day. All right. So I think this starts in chapter 25, Vibrio, Aramonas, and similar organisms. It's a pretty short chapter, so you can, it's got a lot of tables, and it's got a lot of info about each one and what it's doing. On your reference sheet, these would be, if you want to look, you would see these are our ground negative rods still. These are our oxidase positive. Uh, gram negative rods and we will bring out the oxidase um, next week uh, for the lab that's going to be close to this where you see Campylobacter, Pseudomonas, um, Burkholder, Vibrio, Aramonas, and Plesiomonas are all sitting there as gram negative rods with oxidase positive. Okay, kind of give you an idea where we are always on your reference sheet. What chapter did you say? 25, that's where I've got Vibrio. All right. So, Vibrioni ACA, good enough, right? You guys good on that. Vibrio cholera, Vibrio parahemolyticus, Vibrio vulnificus, and Vibrio alcanolyticus. Okay, so we'll try to keep those names keep coming, but hopefully you've, you've heard of Vibrio cholera. You may or may not have heard of Parahemolyticus, and you probably have never heard of the last two. But this is the family Vibrio. The family Aramoni ACA, 
is Aeromonas hydrophila. So that, these are kind of just going to be introducing all the names that we have to play with today. Campylobacter, this is pretty common, Campylobacter ACA, Campylobacter jejuni, Campylobacter coli, Campylobacter fetus. So we have uh, jejuni is usually the main one we will see. And then finally, Helicobacter ACA, which is Helicobacter pylori, H. pylori, uh, very common in the term in medical terms these, these days because of its link to ulceration of the stomach, uh, being the bacteria present and can be treated. So a lot of times ulcers in the old day got classified as a stress. Oh, you're stressed out, you have an ulcer but really there was actually a bacteria they found in most of the ulcerations and now we can treat it with, bacteria, with an antibiotic treatment. But we do test for H. pylori. So that is a test that we'll see in the, in the lab. Enterobacter ACA, Plesomonas shigalloides. So you can kind of gather where that name came from. And we'll start with Vibrio. So I looked at the schedule. I was curious last night to the schedule. I think we are, we're on eight and it's Thursday, all right? So we got nine and 10 next week and then the next Tuesday's another test day. So we got, got kind of halfway through the test unit right now getting ready for exam two in micro, right? Is this exam two, micro exam? Not to lose focus, right? Vibrio. Vibrio is found, where is it found? It's found in fresh and marine waters. So when we think of marine, you know, we think of salt water, I do, and then we, we hear fresh. But does marine really mean, what does that really mean? Anybody? Have a guess -o on that one? Does marine mean fishing waters? Does it mean Salt water. Because this is kind of a stick, stickler we had before, uh, meaning is it salt water? Anybody help me out with marine? What's marine mean? I'm gonna got access. I know y'all had your phones out while ago. Thank you, Allison. Allison's got me on front. So, you know, we've always been to the marina. It says that the marine means of found in or produced by the sea. By the sea. So, our seas are usually salt, right? So, I, I think I was thinking right, but I wanted to point that out. Because when you see fresh and marine waters, sometimes you forget that it can be in a freshwater sample or a marine sample. The morphology is pretty neat because they're curved. They're curved gram negative rods. So you did your gram stain on a Tuesday on, if you did it on E. coli you, and you know, Cleb or Proteus, you saw that pretty much they were cigar shaped. There was no change in the, the structure. These are gonna, these are gonna give you a little bit of different shape when you look at them under the gram stain. The motility is positive for the Vibrio, meaning they do can move around, which means they usually have some, if you look at the background here, you'll see something that helps them move around. Uh, the oxygen requirement to review us once again, facultative anaerobes means, what does that mean? Does it, does it mean I can do something in oxygen or I can't do something in oxygen or I, I gotta live in anaerobic? What, what does facultative mean? They're an anaerobe, right? But if they're facultative, that means they're not obligate anaerobe. So oxygen can be used if it's there, but they don't need it. Okay, so they don't have to have oxygen. But if it is there, they'll use it. Okay, 
unlike an obligate anaerobe, which is if oxygen is there, it dies. Okay, so they have to be outside of an oxygen environment. And a facultative means I, I'll use it, but I also don't have to have it. So I'm not strict anaerobe. Hopefully you're getting that, because we've had that a couple of times already. That's why I was hoping that I'd have a great answer on that one. Okay, so here is an electromicrograph. We see that it's a curve, so almost to uh, not quite a banana, but it's starting to take that appearance of a banana shape. And you see something sticking out the back there that helps it move around, okay? And this is a flagella stain, so we were leaning toward the flagella, um, but a flagella stain really picks up <clears throat> the flagella. But this is more like what we'll see without the flagella stain. This is just a typical gram stain. And the flagella is not staining because it's so thin. Uh, but you see that there is a curve to it. Hopefully you can pick that up. That we're starting to get some kind of curvature to our gram rods, gram negative rods. And they're not just cigar shaped. Biochemically, the key which we started with, we started with it because we have it on our little flow chart is oxidase positive, okay? So go ahead and, and if you want to revert to it, look at who's all, who's all oxidase negative when it comes to gram negative rods, okay? And that's everybody else. <laughs> so everybody in the, the group we used on Tuesday, Clepsi, LA, E. coli, uh, Proteus, all this Salmonella, Shigella, um, Yersinia, and those are all oxidase negative. So if we get a growth of a negative gram negative rod and we want to see if we need to go down the, the, the smaller road of the Campylobacters and the Pseudomonas and the Vibrios, then we just do a simple oxidase test. And that would help us indicate which way we should go. Halo tolerance means that salt water, which would make sense for our marine why we took so much time out of marine is that some vibrio species require an increased concentration of salt for growth. So we have to add sodium chloride to the, the auger to get them to grow better or they would love that environment. So they, they don't shy away from a salt water environment. So the salt does not disrupt the membrane and cause issues. They're not fast Fastidious. What does fastidious mean? So far we've had that with our other organisms. You've already had a test over that on exam one. What does fastidious mean? I was hoping by September 24th we'd be a little more interactive during the lecture. How about Zoom land? Help me out. Forget about it. Forget they're always there. Zoom land, what about a not fastidious, fastidious organism? You're all on mute on Zoom, so come off mute and let me know. Is Brandy trying to talk? He's green boxed over here. I'll ask, how many do you have in here? Five, two, eight, eight. It needs like specific requirements for growth. So, right, if, if it was fastidious, it means it would grow just about on anything, right? Not fastidious means we've got to give it some extra help. So, they still do well on McConkie, XLD, SS, Hectoan, but one they'll, this Vibrio will thrive on. Uh, a selective and differential media, so it is thiol sulfate citrate bile salt sucrose. Or as I almost say every time, TCBY, but I have to leave the S in there for sucrose, so I'll call it TCBS. Okay, so thiol sulfate citrate bile salts is definitely one that is associated with Vibrio. This is a new media that we're looking at. And what it does is it actually differentiates first is that where we'll go. It differentiates cholera from the other Vibrios. 
and that's the sucrose fermenting of the Vibrio cholera. Okay, forms yellow colonies, yellow earth. I get in trouble all the time because um, I'm southern and I go yellow. Um, and I get corrected on that all the time at my house. So sorry if I say yellow a couple of times. A lot of people say, well, what color is that? Never heard of that one before. Anyway, yellow colonies for sucrose ferment or Vibrio cholera was separated, differentiated from all the other Vibrios, but it's selective, meaning that it aids the Vibrio growth and stunts others that would be wanting to grow on this. But we see it, still see it up here, that they do grow well on McConkey. Um, so here is the Vibrio TCBS bile, has bile salts that inhibit the growth of the gram. And I know it says FYI, but to me FYI is, it, it's, it's, it's knowledge. So anything that's on these slides is knowledge based. Um, so don't think this is something you got to, you can't ignore. As you never know when TCBS auger is gonna come up. But bile salts in there, right? We said Vibrio likes salt. So we put bile salts in there. So other gram positive microorganisms and 1% to inhibit the gram positives, but also we put 1% of sodium chloride is incorporated in the media to provide the optimal growth for Vibrio. Sodium thiosulfate sulfates is in there to give a sulfur background. So we can combine that with ferric citrate to detect the production of hydrogen sulfide. So we have that hydrogen sulfide H2S being produced. A very high pH is created in this auger, which suppresses the growth of intestinal bacteria other than the Vibrio. So we get rid of E. coli and we just have Vibrio growing on this media. So if you suspected you had an oxidase positive and you thought it might be Vibrio, get your TCBS auger out, plate it on it, right? And if it, something's growing there tomorrow, you probably got Vibrio how it would work. Uh, something about parahemolyticus, it's, it's non-hemolytic on sheep blood auger, but it's beta hemolytic on human blood auger. Now, I don't know how many samples we have that have human blood, but you could, right? But most everything that we have is sheep blood auger uh, that we have. So we definitely would not see hemolysis with parahemolytic if we just had sheep blood auger. So here's Vibrio cholera just on a blood auger plate. All right, so um, looks kind of alpha she, you know, a little greenish looks to me. Really not doing any hemolysis out here. There it is on a McConkie. So growing back here in the corner. But here it is on TCBS auger. Vibrio color, and that's not, that doesn't even bring out the yellow color of the change. This one more, this one does more. Here is Vibrio parahemolyticus, and we said on blood auger, sheep blood auger, it would not be hemolytic, which it's not, but if it was on human blood, it would be beta. Here it is on TCBS auger. So Vibrio is still growing, but parahemolyticus, since it's not Vibrio um, cholera, it doesn't pick up that the yellow and, and turn. So these, that's the key here is the difference in Vibrio being differentiated here as against all the other Vibrios that just pick up the green and not change to the bright yellow. So we see that a lot. And, I, and I'm trying to give you the idea, but there are some augers that you know, we kind of kind of miss with staph because we didn't have any mannitol salt. And staph aureus likes to turn this same thing with mannitol salt. So we've kind of talked about it before, but we may not have seen it in the lab. Now there's definitely the comparison between cholera and parahemolyticus of the difference. And this is a differential. Okay, remember when we say selective versus differential, Selective means some things are going to grow and not grow. Differentiate means we're going to be able to tell by how it's growing what we have.
McConkey, right? It's selective and differential. It's selective for gram negatives, but it's differential for who? Lactose fermenters. That. Y'all got that straight? Okay. Hopefully you already had that, but maybe not. Uh, identify, we're gonna, these resemble the enterics. Okay, we had the enterics last couple of lectures. They resemble the enterics because they have the ability to ferment sugars and utilize amino acids, ornithine, lysine, and arginine. And they resemble pseudomonas, right? Because they are oxidase positive. So on your sheet, you see pseudomonas is sitting there number two below Campylobacter. Okay, and it's mainly because oxidase positive. And then this one's a, a neat one and um, you know, for Vibrio, most species are stream test positive. And you're thinking, what's the stream test, right? Have y'all ever heard of a stream test? Okay, so, but remember, parahemolyticus there is not. So another way we differentiate them would be a stream test. But that's a stream test. We put the organism on a slide, we put our loop in it, and if we can pick it up, and any of you been to Chicago? Just not to change the subject. Anybody been to Chicago? There's Beats Place in Chicago. Kind of famous. It's a bunch of them all over Chicago. Anybody know what it is? Starts with a G. G Giordano's, is that it? G Giordano's Pizza? This is what they're known for. So when I think of the stream test, they bring your pizza out, and what they do is they take the little thing that you, and they pick up the cheese and see how high they can go with it off the table. That's what I think of a stream test is the same thing. Taking the cheese and you're pulling it up five feet off the pizza and then you drop it back. That's how much cheese is over the pizza. So it's really, you really, really good. You really didn't relate that to food, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I did because it's lunch, right? Yeah. Oh, it was so good. So we so we like we had a big we had a big dinner there. I took like I took like fifty people and so we ordered like all this pizza, right? Really, really good. But that's what I think about with a string test. And that's who, that's all the vibrios except parahemolyticus. Okay. Here is another thing that we use, and I I think it's in here. I'm gonna find it in your book because the name of this is so long that I never can remember the, the whole name. And I'm looking for um, the O. Is that O129? I see a O139 in your book. Anybody else find me the O129? Oh, here it is, back here on page uh, 405. You can find this O. So this is a uh, string test is there. And then we got this Vibrio static test using O129. And the reason I have to look it up because it's actually 2,4-diamino-6,7-diisopropafenylteridin impregnated disc. That's what it is. Okay, 0 129 Okay, so what that says is if we think we have cholera, kind of like what we do with strep, we put these discs on there and it will, what? Not let it grow. So Vibrio cholera is susceptible to the O129 and the parahemolyticus is resistant to it so it would grow. So another way we could differentiate the two species of Vibrio is by the O129 disc. Halo tolerance, um, non-halophilic would be cholera versus halophilic which is Vibrio parahemolyticus. So I don't think that's, I think that's in here. I don't see it. Maybe susceptibility. We got Vibrio serial diagnostic. So what does this tell you? Who wants to translate what that, by the way, that slide means? If I said halo tolerance, halo tolerance is increased salt, right? So if non-halophilic would mean I don't really like the increase in salt would be Vibrio cholera versus halophilic, which would be the parahemolyticus, would be more apt to enjoy the high salt content. 
Okay, so that's kind of how we work our way through diagnosing or separating the two vibrios that we, we want to talk about now. But now we're going to talk about what makes them important. And I'm just going to go ahead and guess that none of you have had cholera. I don't know where you've been in the world, but you may have to come in contact with it. If you're like a super, super explorer or a super, super uh, mission worker where you go into the worst parts of the world and take, try to take care of some people. Anybody been exposed, gotten cholera at all, Vibrio cholera? Okay, so the etiological agent of cholera. So we hear cholera, Vibrio cholerae, uh, most commonly asymptomatic and mild. If you do get a severe form, it lasts for a couple of days or onset after a couple of days of severe watery diarrhea. Stool specimens are colorless, odorless, free of protein, but you are having watery diarrhea. And we call it rice water stool. So that's kind of a key term to put with cholera and vibrio cholera, meaning it has flex of mucus, so a mucusy watery stool something like that when it's brought into you. So not your typical, oh my gosh, I'm having this, you know, ugly, ugly diarrhea. I'm having watery diarrhea. Okay, so there is a difference. There's a bucket of it. We've got, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, with Vibrio collar, we can have vomiting as well. And it may lead to our shock or our acidosis. Losing that much water is the problem. The transmission of it, this is where we could have gotten it. We could have ended up with Vibrio collar if we eat contaminated food or water, meat, fish, seafood, shellfish, and milk. And so we have this seafood, especially shellfish, Underline seafood for cholera, salt water, marine life. Okay, there you go. And there he is, our beautiful, um, what kind of crab is this? Anybody know? They make really, really good crab claws with them. It's got blue, blue, blue crab. So, has he got another name? Nobody? Oh, what's the crab name? Oh, that's that's not good. Fly could be a vector in there. We got bad water sources. This is Ecuador. This is kind of what I mean. If you've gone on a mission trip, ended up in one of these settings that's just just basically put together. Definitely, you know, bathroom into the water could be a problem with other things. Cholera epidemic in Peru. Got a lot of uh, Bangladesh. And this is from way back. This is a great cartoon, which is what if you drink the water, death could be on your doorsteps, right? Kind of thing. The epidemic cholera, 1849 and 1855 in London was associated with contaminated water supply. death, bringing cholera in 1912. Not sure where this came from. Heat journal, cholera. All right, so that was our cholera. So contaminated food or water, seafood, or just drinking bad water, polluted water. The vibrios there. Parahemolyticus is also a gastroenteritis. Seashore injuries. Okay, so not just eating seafood can be a problem. This is the parahemal, this is the vibrio that causes wound infections once you get in the water, whether you're handling the seafood and cutting it and bringing it in and you get cuts and scrapes, I mean, for messing with crabs and stuff, you know, other seafood, but it gives the parahemolyticus would be the wound infector where the other vibrio species are gastroenteritis. This one, Vulnificus, you may have heard of this from 
Gulf Shores. Anybody? This is what's known as the marine bacterium, the causative agent, consumption, waterborne wounds. It can happen there. It can be from consumptions of raw oysters and shellfish. So if you like to half shell oysters and they've been pulled out of a contaminated area, they can be contaminated with Vibrio. Um, septicemia and the immunosuppressed, because you'll have a big warning on the seafood restaurants that say if you're immunosuppressed, don't eat our raw seafood. This is the reason. You got chronic liver disease, you got cirrhosis, it's 50 to 90% fatality can happen. Cellulitis, my, myositis, shock, hypotension. We've got these bullious skin lesions. We can take antibiotic for it, that's the good thing you want to avoid contact of wounds with the seawater where this is hanging out and avoid eating raw or undercooked oysters and shellfish. Ugly pictures there. Ooh, this was a worker that was working with contaminated seafood. Look at his hand. Okay. Here's a case for us. A 31 year old man died after eating flesh eating. Oh, died not eating it. He, 31 year old man died after flesh eating bacteria in the ocean sent him into septic shock. He ignored his new tattoo warnings that said, don't go swim in the Gulf after you get them. He went swimming anyway and he got septic in his uh, tattoo. Um, he went to the emergency room three days later. He developed chills and fever, swelling over the tattoo site. He thought uh, throughout both of his legs, doctors believe the recent tattoo was more so most likely how the bacteria entered the body. So again, I know we did this uh, question last year and I'm, I'm like in the minority, but I wanna see if I'm getting stronger numbers because I like to say, this is the way I like to say it. You know, you always want to rebel against your parents, right? Is that true? Anybody want to rebel against your parents? No, everybody want to follow their parents every every rule they made. Well, anyway, so if you disobeyed your parents, you were known as a rebel, right? Society rebel. You were rebelling against society. So you went out and got a tattoo. Well, see, that's flipped now. That's flipped. So to rebel against society these days, you don't get a tattoo. See, society says go get a tattoo. So a show of hands so I can see where I am on, and you can do this too, Zoom. How many of us do not have tattoos? Not one, not one ink has been applied whatsoever. Yeah, look at all the rebels in the room. Look at us. Yeah, now we're feeling better. We got one on Zoom, only one, two, two on Zoom. Yes, I want everybody to feel special that we are rebelling against society by not getting tattoos, because that's just the norm now. Parents are okay with it now. They don't care. They're like, yeah, I go, I'll get one with you. Um, <laughs> but not now, no, no, we're rebelling. Okay, so this is a, another reason not to get a tattoo, all right, is to not go into the ocean after you get it, because this man died after he did that. And this is what's known as the flesh-eating bacteria, so Vibrio, Vol Volnificus, and there's the tattoo, and there is the swelling and the ugliness, and he died. Okay, so we definitely don't want tattoos. All right, so that's that's a lot right there with Vibrio, and it's and it can get fuzzy in those definitions about where you're getting it, how you're getting it. Okay, so just know Vibrio. It could be from the water. It could, be, and this is the Vibrios. This is, a, and we'll have to make distinctions between the three that we have. But Volnificus is the flesh eating. Okay. Cholera, enterocolitis, right? Gastroenteritis, the rice watery stool. Okay. So keep those, keep those straight. We're going to move on now to Aramonas. 
species. This one is a freshwater, not a marine water. So Aramonas has a little difference to it. And on your sheet, on your little review sheet, your guide is right underneath Vibrio. Okay, and you do have these broken down. If you see this for Vibrio, you got cholera as severe watery diarrhea, which is known as rice water diarrhea. Vulnificance is the uh, flesh eating, wound eating, uh, and parahemolyticus is from eating raw oysters from the diarrhea, okay? So oysters are connected to a lot of Vibrio. And you don't think about it until they say, oh yeah, we got these out in the Gulf and the Gulf is being fed by the Mississippi River, right? And we don't think about that being contaminant, uh, getting into that, those beds of oysters. But back to Aramonas, we're fresh watery, so we're not in salt water. Their morphology is gram-negative rod, and that's where we are. They're, they're modal too, they can move. They're facultative anaerobes, just to review all those things that we've already said. They're oxidase positive, yay. And they're sucrose fermenters. Now, what, what was the distinction? Who wants to help me and tell me what was the distinction between the TCB S auger? What, what was the key? What is the S? Sucrose. Sucrose, okay. All right, you think you're paying attention. Good deal. There's a gram stain. Not as curvy as a Vibrio, I didn't think, right? Aramonis is not. Looks, you know, we can see a little indentions, but nothing like Vibrio moving side, I mean, making a wave. Does have the flagella, so if we did the flagella stain, we definitely see the flagella. Growth requirements, it's good growth on selective media. Uh, Aramonis hydrophila is a beta hemolytic on sheep blood and a non-lactose fermenter. So again, we have our blood plate, our McConkie plate that we started out with this week before today. In our notes, it says selective and non-selective media. Oh, it does? Yeah, for our slide. Your slide? I don't know. Good growth. Well, I don't think blood is very selective, so you're probably right. Good point. Go with that. McConkie's selective, so it's going to grow on blood. Beta hemolytic on blood. But it's a gram negative, right? We've seen, we've already seen another beta hemolytic on blood. Who's that? Remember, you looked at it really close. Some of you took pictures of it Tuesday. Number one. E. Coli. Yeah, E. coli was beta hemolytic too, wasn't it? Okay. You don't think of that. Once we get away from staph and strep, you're like, ah, we don't worry about that hemolytic anymore. It's still there. Okay. So this is another one that's beta hemolytic on sheep blood auger, but it's a non-lactose fermenter. And we, we do, I hate to say this, but we do have non-lactose E. coli fermenter. There can be a strain of that. So again, what would be the test? What, if we had this growing, what would be our first test we could use to separate E. coli from Aramonas hydrophila? Oxidase. Don't forget the simplest. Oxidase positive for Aramonas, oxidase negative for E. coli. Remember those groups. Keep it simple. All right, so selective media and differential media, of course, on y'all. I'll go with that. I'm good with that. Here is our some of our other tests that we introduced for the enterics. The triple sugar iron auger gave us an AA, which means acid produced, meaning it's fermenting the sugar in the slant and the butt. Uh, the gelatin hydrolysis was positive, DNA is positive. So I know we're not mixing in aromonas into our chart, but we could, do, we could put a chart together with these two. And then sodium chloride, no growth. Okay, so this would not be a what? It would not be a halo filler, right? The AA means that your tube is completely yellow, right? Yep.
So where is Arimonas? Cold-blooded animals, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. That's the reservoir. So where do they live? They live in water sources. So the transmission happens out of the water, whether it be a wound infection, septicemia, um, non-intestinal infection, so urinary tract, respiratory tract, meningitis, otitis, conjunctivitis, and endocarditis. Non-intestinal infection, so it can be other places. And then we have diarrhea too. So it can be all around, depending on where it wants to go. All right. You're probably asking yourself, well, why is he bringing in Plesiomonas gigalodes right now if it's a member of the Enterobacteraceae family? Okay, just hang with me because you're going to see. But we do switch in and out of family sometimes. So Plesiomonas, we probably saw it where? Last lectures, somewhere in the list of things, maybe. But now we're going to kind of describe it. Plesiomonas shigaloides, fresh water, gram-negative rod, motility positive, facultative anaerobe, oxidase positive, and that's why it gets moved over here okay, for the oxidase. And I think we, when we first listed all those enterics, we said all are oxidase negative except, right? Remember that? Yay, we connected the electric. We connected it. That was probably last week. Right, last Thursday. That's how it gets moved over. There it is. That looks just like what we had Tuesday. Gram negative rod. Good growth on selective and non selective media, non hemolytic, and it does not ferment the lactose nor the glucose. I mean, lac lactose nor sucrose. Does anybody want to do the TSA slant for plesiomoides, shigaloides? Is it on our, old, our notes, that big chart we had? Is it on there at all from last lecture? I didn't bring that with me, I forgot. Mary's helping me. See if plesiomonas shigaloides is on there. All those biochemical reactions on the back. Nope. Okay. You don't see it? Just saying. It's okay. You should have been able to see it. Oh, we've already passed that. There we go. We're going the right way. There's McConkey. So there it is on Hectoan. We're going to see that one next week. The Hectoan, that is. There's what I was looking for. KA, alkaline slant, meaning it's a, what? Glucose only, does that make sense? Is that not, we have TSI too, is that a glucose only, KA? Because remember the alkaline slant gets exposed to oxygen if it's glucose only, turns it back to red. Okay. What's the clinical significance? It's in cold and warm blooded animals. Human illness is diarrhea. And you get off the hook because it says only seen occasionally in the United States. We doing good? You are getting it? It's a lot of names. A lot of names. We have a big test for names. Big test. All right, you can't flow bacter and helicobacter species. So again, where is it on our little flow chart? I know I, I love this flow chart. Hope y'all will fall in love with it too one day. Uh, Campylobacter, jejuni, and 
Don't see helicobacter. Where's, oh, there it is. It's other. It's down on the other side. It's over there with Legionella and Bacteroides and Fusobacter. So, so it's still there. Still gram negative rod. But it's kind of left it out. It's kind of kind of gotten out of the uh, kind of gotten out of the oxidase positive line. But we'll see what happens. Campylobacter, leading cause of bacterial diarrhea worldwide. So well, that makes it move up the list a little bit. Uh, these are curved gram negatives, as we've talked. Motility positive. They are organisms that are microaerophilic, meaning we got to reduce the oxygen down to five to ten percent, and increase the CO2 up to three to ten percent. They will not grow in ambient air or anaerobically, so we kind of got to get this. This would be what we use a CO2 incubator definitely for, okay? Because I think it's six percent CO2 in, in the incubator that has CO2 hooked up to it. There it is. It almost looks like a spiral key. But it's a gram negative rod. Just got a little shape to it. Again, we talked about the oxygen requirement, right? Right, microaerophilic. For Campylobacter, but we also have to turn the temp up. For Jejuni and coli, we've got to get it up to 42 degrees. So you might see us adjust the growth of them. Uh, we have two incubators downstairs, and usually about this time we're getting into maybe not quite to mycology, but sometimes we'll turn one of those up to 42 or turn it down. Uh, to get it off 37, and this would be a case where we turn up 1 to 42 to give it a little more heat. Jejuni and coli grow best at 42, but all human isolates grow at 37. So if we turned it up, it would just be for to make it best. They're still going to grow at 37. Jejuni and coli do not grow at room temp, so they can't let it drop down to 25. Citrobacter fetus grows well at 37 and room temp. Oh, and room temp, but it does not grow at 42. So if we brought one out, we thought Campylobacter was growing at our 40 in our 42, but not in our 37. That, that might be the others, right? It's a way of differentiating our Citrobacters. They're oxidase positive. They are non-fermentative because they do not grow anaerobically. So I guess this would be one where the butt would be still red, if that's the anaerobic growth. Campylobacter fetus used to use standard blood culture bottles for that one. Um, Jejuni and coli are stool specimens. So a stool specimen will be plated as soon as possible or refrigerated. And then we have something called Carrie Blair, which is a transport media. So you might hear that, that we need to put the stool in Carrie Blair uh, to keep it before while it's being transported. Don't forget that little note there at the top. Uh, Campylobacter auger is selective media should be used for the enteric Campylobacters and then placed in the proper atmosphere of 80, 42 degrees. So let's connect those dots. So Campylobacter auger, we're going to use for the enterics. Which one's the enterics? Jejuni and coli, right? Jejuni and coli grow best where? 42 degrees. So use the Campylobacter auger to plate your enteric Campylobacters, put them up at 42. Which one does not grow at 42? Fetus, right? So fetus does not grow in selective media and should be plated on chocolate and then placed in a microaerophilic atmosphere at 37. So 
Question, how many times do you think you're going to have to distinguish between the three types of Campylobacter? Probably not very often, right? But you will get a Campylobacter out of the stool. Uh, you will see that. So when we, if we were wanting to really put, the, put you to the test, we would get out the, when we get the Hectoin out next week, would be to bring out a Campylobacter and put it on there with it. Okay, so we can see that there is growth. Okay, just because it's, you know, enteric too. Um, but that's how we would distinguish all three with, is just that way. Here is our Campy anaerobe jars. And we actually have incubators just for Campylobacter. So we've got one now, it's just a little set on the side. I've got two, got three incubators. I got one that's air oxygen at 37. We got one at CO2 at 37. And I got Campylobacter, which would be what? Bumped up to what? 42, yes. So you can have your own little campy um, incubator there. And we do put them in anaerobic pouches and put them in there. So this is an anaerobic chamber that you could do. And we have packs that you can put them in there, but they've kind of gotten away from that big bulky jar uh, that locks down. And now we just go into a bag and put in a, an anaerobic uh, pouch that sucks all the oxygen out of that bag, absorbs it out, and then gives us an anaerobic environment. These organisms do not stain well with gram stain. We got to use carbofusion is a better counter stain. Saffron you're going to have to apply for a lot longer. So it's two to three minutes longer with the saffron if you're going to do a regular gram stain. Now, the great, great test question characteristic of Campylobacter is this. They are pleomorphic morphology, meaning they have many shapes and they look like S-shaped seagulls flying across the slide. So we call them gull wings with short spirals. So we have this S-shaped morphology, and that's what we will definitely be a test question of resembling seagulls, that's the hint to the question, to get you on Campylobacter. Two types of colony morphology, it can be non-hemolytic round convex, it can be non-hemolytic flat spreading colonies. They're tan, gray, and slightly pink in color. So we got this to look at. I know you are like, well, that looks just like anything else, right? That's a tough one. There is the round convex. So how do we distinguish it? We identify it growing at 42 degrees on campy auger in a microaerophilic atmosphere. Oxidase positive, so we've said Campylobacters are positive. They're in that, that group right under oxidase positive and their characteristic microscopic is the seagull S wing look to them. I was thinking we had a picture. I know I got pictures somewhere. We've moved on from chapter 26, right? Where's our next one? 33. 33, thank you. Let's see if they had a picture in here. See one yet? Nope, sorry. I might have one, I don't know if it comes up. Um, for lab diagnosis of Campylobacter diarrhea, we use, we can use nucleic acid testing PCR. It's the most sensitive. We can also use an enzyme immunoassay. It's the next most sensitive, or we can do a campy culture. It's less sensitive, but we can use that. So if you don't have nucleic acid testing in your lab, then you move to enzyme, immunoenzyme. You may not have that, so then you go to the campy auger grow it that way. It can be laborious and expensive. It takes two to three days. 
and sometimes we can miss the pathogenic species. There it is. There's my picture. So you're supposed to picture yourself looking out at the ocean and over the ocean you see seagulls flying. Yes. And did you put you right there on the beach? Yes. So what is the clin clinical significance? Remember, fetus is from blood, right? This is not a stool. One. Fetus is isolated from the blood and immunosuppressed patients. So we got campylobacter breaking out if we have immunosuppressed. If you work at the cancer centers, uh, you can end up with somebody having uh, septic from fetus. Jujuni, again, remember, is the most leading cause of bacterial diarrhea in the worldwide. Citrobacter jejuni. That is kind of FYI there, I'm good with that one. All right, so where does it come from? How does it break out? Epidemics have been linked to milk, meat, and water. Most patients are children under a year and adults 20 to 29. So if I was connecting those two, I would say the child and the mother. Okay, about the same age as the mother and the, the babies here. And it can be sexually transmitted. Okay. All right, so that was Campylobacter. And that's, we're getting close to the end, are we? Yes? That's the end of our slides. Oh, that was the end? This is the end? Just say Helicobacter pylori? It says nothing. It says nothing? Oh my God. It's stuff at gastritis and gastric ulcers. Yeah, that's it. That's the main thing. 1983. A spiral shaped organism resembling Campylobacter was isolated. So this is not, it's not old. This is kind of new. I know y'all think 83 is old. I don't. This is us smack in the middle of high school when this happened. Okay? Because that's what it was. But prior to 83, there was every ulcer you had was you're stressed out, you've got a bleeding ulcer, you're going to die if we don't get you, you know, better. So gastric ulcers. H. pylori. It needs to be plated to chocolate and placed in the campy jar at 37 degrees for seven days if we think we have a specimen. So how would we get a specimen of H. pylori? On a gastric lavage, right? They would actually go in and get a gastric juice to do this with. Otherwise, we're having to do other things. So do we need a rock? Uh, this is not on your note? Sheet no. at all? Your little notes, no. study our, notes? Our notes stopped. Guess your notes stopped in 1983. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, you got gastric ulcers, right? Yeah, that's what yeah. our notes are. Yeah, I might put I plate it on chocolate. Yeah. If you got one. I, I've never gotten a sample that said, hey, give me H. pylori. But could we get this somehow else? What about a stool? Would it be in our stool? Thank you, Mr. Um, infection affects half the population of the world. Now, that being said, if you ever stayed, I mean, you know, if I, if I talked to y'all about late night internet watching, well, I ran across this doctor. I think he's a surgeon, maybe a heart surgeon, but he's a dietitian now. And he's all about eating what you need to give up to eat. It's kind of like the Tom Brady diet. Get rid of anything that grows at night, like tomatoes. Don't eat tomatoes. Get tomatoes out of your out of your diet. Y'all hadn't watched this guy. He's got like real colored. He looks like I'm gonna really date myself. Sally Jesse Raphael. Anybody remember her? She wore these like red glasses. So this is this gray-haired doctor. He's wearing like red glasses, and he's talking about don't eat tomatoes. Don't eat those because they're bad for you. Okay. But one thing that he said was that he thinks there is a connection between the brain and bacteria. And I, I bought, bought right into this watching. And he says that H. pylori is the key to a good diet. Because H. pylori is one of the few bacteria that send good signals to the brain. Most of the other bacteria in your digestive tract are bad. 
and they tell your brain to eat sugar. Eat more sugar. I want sugar, I want sugar, I want sugar. Eat some more sugar. So they have your brain like, I gotta eat sugar. I gotta go get a sugary snack. I gotta drink a Coke. I don't want a candy bar. I want whatever's bad for me, he thinks, but H. pylori, don't knock it out with the, back, with the antibiotic because it's good and it tells your brain to eat healthy and not eat sugar. That's just watch this guy. I can't remember his name. Um, but I'll come up. I'll find it. I'll find it. Okay. All right. So half the world's population has H. pylori in their, in their GI tract, their stomach. The disease is responsible for most duodenal and gastric ulcers with two to three fold increased risk of gastric cancer. And that's what we worry about most, like with reflux, right? Because the esophageal lining is a little softer than the stomach and you can end up really, really putting some pressure on those cells there at the end of the connection of the esophagus and the stomach. Okay, so we got out a little early. So you can get some lunch, we got 12.30 lab. And lab it shouldn't take, um, you know, we, we're just going to develop our APIs and call them. I do have the um, wipes, so don't run off. Zoom land, we're going to let you go. Stop the share in the meeting.